I know you're not a huge drinker, but do you want to partake? I'm a, yes, I do. I, I'm I'm just not a I'm not a fancy drinker. Oh yeah, the Kirkland. I'm a drinker. So so I was like, yeah, the Kirkland. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. The Kirkland. So when I was coming here, I was like, oh god, I'm gonna get, get some good whiskey. <laughs> All right, cheers. Mm. Oh, cheers. Cheers, 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 cheers. So cheers. good to meet you finally. Yeah, good to meet you guys. Very excited. Oh, Dr. That's some good George, stuff. ooh, back in the studio. When, um, how long ago was our last um, episode? That was, that was a while back. I want to say it's summer 2020. Wow. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that yeah, was yeah, episode yeah. fifty something. It was right into the pandemic. It was oct- maybe it's October. It was it was definitely the first year of the pandemic. Yeah, and because I remember we had uh, we talked a lot about the masks and yep. uh, and because, why why Americans don't wear masks. Yep, because yep. at that time America was going through the shit, and yep. we were kind of okay over here at the time. Yep. And so and look, look at us now. <laughs> the tables have turned. It's like that episode did not age well. <laughs> no, it did not. We talked so much shit about the US. <laughs> we did. And now we we're did. kind of in it ourselves. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I mean, how have you been, George? Been good. Been good. Yeah. Been hanging in there through this lockdown. You know, um, it's different because we, we have two kids, you know, and, and so you, you're juggling working from home, you're juggling you know, being teacher and coach and everything to two kids and keeping them sane and keeping yourself sane. So been okay, been okay, you know? Yeah. Well, as a mental health professional, while we were going through um, those two months of lockdown, yeah, like what was going through your head? What was going through my head? A lot. I mean, f- first of all, I, I you know, I, I still had the privilege of going to work every day. Oh, that's so right. So I, I had a tongshin zen, right? A coveted oh. tongshin zen. So every day, and, and our compound had zero positive cases the whole time. Wow. Not a single one. So um, so I was free to, you know, take my motor scooter to work down these empty streets. right? And surreal, that, right? Surreal. And I where's, mean, like, how far is your um, place? It's about, it's about 20 minute, a 20 minute, 20 minute lockdown scooter ride. Right. So that's pretty far. Yeah. It's about 35 minutes non-lockdown. Mm. And still on the same side of town? Still on the same side of town. Still Pudong. Okay. Yeah. So I was going I was going 20 minutes on the scooter every day to and from work. Um, so I had the privilege of experiencing, I think, a quote unquote, normal work schedule, you mm. know, and I did, I wasn't, you know, with the kids day in and day out and trying to get them to pay attention to a screen and, you know, all of that. Right. Um my wife, you know, had a much harder time because, because you know, she was doing that, imagine. you know, every single day. You, right? were, you, you got to like escape, and the I got to escape. Day. Yeah, I felt really, really privileged. But you know that, the, and and I didn't have to live at the hospital. We had like two hundred people living at the hospital. Wow! Because you need a lot of people to keep the hospital running, and and if you go home, you might not be able to get out, depending on what happens overnight, right? So a lot of people just simply couldn't risk going home. So what specifically was the uh, the policy that allowed you to go to work? So there's essential workers, right? Mm. So um, among them, healthcare workers, police people, maintenance people, things like that. So there's these classes of essential workers. And if you, um, if you were one of those essential workers, you were essentially given this, um, send me this uh, certificate from your work, you know, with the, with the red stamp on it. And and certifying you in, as an essential worker, and then that allowed you to be on the streets. But but we needed them because you know everything was disrupted, right? Like people couldn't get healthcare, people couldn't get to the hospital, people couldn't get their medications. You know the quality, the delivery services were down. You know we couldn't send anything. So a lot of times, you know, uh, if our hospital driver was full of delivery medications, or there are certain medications that he, he couldn't deliver, and we had to deliver ourselves, like. Uh, the doctors on, on, wow. on in our own cars and our own scooters, you know, after work, we would just drive around and, and make the deliveries, you know, wherever we could, because there's certain controlled medications that, that, that regular drivers can't deliver. So uh, we just had to do it. So besides actually delivering like yourself medicine to people who need it, what, what was the other essential work that you were doing throughout that time? Seeing patients. So, so how would you so, see the patients? So so in mental health, we have the privilege of being able to go online for the most part, right? For for most things, we can take everything to an online platform. And so that's what we did. 
you know, um, for other more emergency services, right, and and essential medical services like, um, you know, ob right, people giving birth, right, in the emergency room, people having true emergencies, bleeding out, stuff like that, you know, we, we could keep those going. But some of the the non-essential services, things like elect, elective surgeries, um, and the definition of elective is pretty wide <laughs> during the <laughs> lockdown, right? Basically, if you're not dying, wow. right, you 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 can't get it. Um, any of the, most of the outpatient stuff, you know, ENT, dentistry for sure, those close right away because those are having to do with the respiratory system, and you, you know, just couldn't keep that going. But how do you prove if like a if a if a surgery is elective or not, like, how do you prove, like, if I don't have this surgery, I'm going to die? Like, I think there's some surgeries that are pretty straightforward. It's not so much I don't have the surgery, might be a lot die. Gray area. Yeah, it might, it's so, so even like most cancer surgeries, I mean, they're not elective in the true sense, right? Like, if you don't get it, you're going to die, but you don't need it tonight, you know? Mm. And it, it's kind of like, if you don't need it tonight, we can't do it. Yeah, it's like if you're bleeding out, <laughs> yeah, you like literally if, have to. If you if you need it to save your life right now, can do it, right? If you don't need it to save it, your, save your life right now, maybe we can do it if you need it in the next couple of days and you bring a 48-hour COVID test, <laughs> right? Even giving birth, you needed a 48-hour COVID test. And how long was test. it like that? It was like that for almost three months. I mean, thankfully for a lot of, you know, hospitals like ours, we have a negative pressure room where even if you don't have the COVID test or there's a question or whatever, we can, we can see you in the negative pressure room, which is a room in which there's negative air pressure, right? So that nothing is going out, right? Things can only come in and then the, there's a special ventilation oh, wow. system okay. for those rooms, right? So that room is essentially isolated ventilation wise from the rest of the hospital and air, the pressure, there's a pressure differential that guarantees that, right? So you have to go through like several sets of doors, um, you know, to get into, we, we have those rooms. And so we can do some things, you know, during the lockdown, even without all of the precautions, but, um, but it was tough. I mean, it was tough for healthcare. It was mm -hmm. really tough. Mm -hmm. And it was tough for people who, you know, COVID doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It happens to people who are having real problems and having their real lives and having real sicknesses. And, you know, I think the way that we factor in COVID death and COVID injury, we have to think about, you know, what was the impact on people who couldn't get what they needed, yeah. right? Mental health or, or, or otherwise. Yeah, just on the way over here, my the, the taxi driver was telling me about people in his compound, you know, that unfortunately you know, couldn't get to the hospital during the lockdown because mm -hmm. you didn't have a tongshin sen and your 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 illness wasn't deemed severe enough, you know, for you to get permission from the Jiu Hui to to go. And yeah. that was that's a problem. I think I think what's weighing on probably a lot of people's minds is like the question of like the total, if you looked at the total balance sheet of the lockdown, yeah, and e and even what we're going through now, which is kind of like lockdowns officially lifted, but it still feels like start and stop, start and stop kind of deal with the uh, the COVID testing, the mass testing, the uh, two day lockdowns that complexes have to go through. Um, but I think the discussion is like the total balance sheet of had we locked down versus had we not locked down kind of what would the human cost of all that look like compared to each other? And I don't think, you know, and no one really knows. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, that's a gargantuan task to measure, I think, right? Because there's just like the physical cost, you know, the economic impact, which I think is already hard enough to measure, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's that's long-term. There's a physical cost, right? People who were injured or who died either directly from COVID or indirectly, right? Because they, like I said, couldn't get what they needed or their family couldn't get what they needed. Then you have, I think, the um, the psychological cost, not just mental illness and mental health, because there is that for sure. But then there's also the loss of a sense of security and confidence, right? In, the, in, in what we call the base, right? Of what you're standing on. Mm -hmm. Like how stable is the base? And I think, you know, have you guys heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You have this hierarchy where, you know, we live in Shanghai, right? In, in modern China. And I think, uh, you know, most people here 
dwelt in the upper regions of Maslow's hierarchy for pretty much their whole life, right? And and so never truly were food insecure, water insecure, whatever. And then for the first time, you know, they were truly food insecure and truly water insecure. And who's going to help us, right? And yeah. and the Jewish ways, like, you know, this was maybe when I, I remember, I don't know, you know, I'm sure you guys do too, when 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 the lockdown first started and it was like these twangos, right? These group buys were happening and I didn't know how to, <laughs> you know, and you're sitting there like literally hitting refresh, like on your phone, you know, a thousand times trying to get bread. And, and you know, it's it's one thing I think, and I don't want to make light of it, you know, if you're, if you're for yourself, if you live by yourself and you're like, all right, I could eat rice and soy sauce like I'm a college student for a couple of days, right? This thing. But if you've got some kids and you have like, you know, they don't have milk or they don't have eggs and, you, you know, and, and even if you do for two days, what about the days and weeks and nobody knows when it's going to end? I mean, it's pretty discombobulating, right? And so now that we're like kind of looking back on the lockdown, I think, knock on wood, I don't know, <laughs> right? We have a big citywide testing thing today. We don't know the results of it yet, right? So, but but what's the cost in terms of like how secure do people think the the the, the fabric of Shanghai or China is? Can I can I rely on it? If I'm going to see my future here, right? And I'm thinking about my future for my myself or my career, or my my family, like, is it stable enough? Is the bedrock of that stable enough for me to actually invest in in, the, in that direction? This mm. is exactly something I've been thinking about. I think many of us have been thinking about. Yeah. You know, it, it's something I've personally been trying to reconcile through these last few weeks. And it's the idea of that, you know, how much faith and confidence do you have going forward, right? And the way... I try to reconcile all this, and at least how I try to present it to myself. For better or for worse, I look at the last, well, actually objectively, if you look at the last couple of months, it is objectively an anomaly mm -hmm. in my 13 plus years here in, in Shanghai, China. Um, all of that time, has been pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. Um, this has definitely, these last, you know, this year really has definitely been, I would say, the worst period and time that I've experienced here, living here. Um, but that's what I have to tell myself, that it is an, an anomaly, but it does shake our foundation of what we believe. And I think what I've seen, especially amongst a lot of us who've grown up in the West, and even foreigners, they, I think it exposes a certain level of subconscious that we're still tainted with a lot of the subconscious fears and concerns and even biases that we were raised with. Um, and I've noticed this in myself. Like, I, I, I have spoken very positively about my overall experience in China. Mm -hmm. But even me, I've noticed that this lockdown has kind of awakened. There's a whole subconscious layer in me, and it's filled with partially a lot of the messaging that I grew up with that, you know, yeah. China, bad, all that messaging, right? Mm -hmm. I was talking to um, my last guest, Jamie Dixon, and he was talking about, you know, our beliefs and the stories we tell ourselves are reinforced by signs we see in the real world little signs here and there, they accumulate, they reinforce what we believe. And now, you know, with the lockdown, it has given us a lot of signs. And I think it exposes that no matter how long we live here, and no matter how positively I, I believe about my overall experience in China, there will always be attached to me this underlying layer of, well, can I trust it completely? And is it just all going to fall apart? And it's, it, it, I struggle to reconcile all that within me, especially given what we've been through. But I also don't want to be a prisoner of the moment and be like, well, because we went, just went through all these, and we are still going through this, that I'm stuck in the moment of everything's doom and gloom yeah. when the vast majority of the experience has been positive. Yeah. 
So that's, that's what I struggle with personally. And I think that touches upon kind of what you were saying and that faith and confidence. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a really good, excuse me. <clears throat> I think that's a really good point, what you talk about the unconscious things that it brought up from our childhood, right? <clears throat> you want some more Sorry. water or something? Sorry, I think I got I'm not. I'm not used to this high quality whiskey. Yeah, so I'm yeah, like choking yeah, yeah. on the. You it's know, too I'm good. Like, choking I'm on like, ecstasy. It's in a, it's in a crystal you're, glass. You're drinking gasoline and, most of the time. I'm drinking Kirkland, like I told you. <laughs> anyway, you, I know it's that's actually true. But anyway, um, but but no, I think I think what you're saying is exactly right. Like, and I, I think all of us. It probably resonates with all of us here growing up as ABCs, right? I think uh, we grew up in <clears throat> relative security, right, in the states where. Um, you know, like I, I think we talked about last time, right? We, we, you know, the U.S. has not fought a war on our soil for, you know, what, since the Civil War. We grew up in a place that was totally relatively stable. And, and maybe that's, you know, some things are changing, right? There's a lot of problems, right, in, in, in the U.S. domestically right now where, where people are feeling really, really profoundly unsafe. And there's conversations around that. But um, for the most part, we didn't feel this existential threat. And I think that for a large percentage of the Shanghai population here, they felt that for the first time right? yeah. during, during, during this period, during the lockdown period. And the younger generations felt that for the first time. Oh yeah, right. The younger generations who didn't have the experiences of previous decades. I mean, I'm, I'm cognizant that we're having this conversation in China. So, you know, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's some, you know, some, some we things know. that have to be assumed, but, <laughs> but you know, the, the, the history, the, the experiences of the, of the, the history is different. Right. And, and, and I think, um, sufficient to say that they were, like I said, used to living in those upper layers of Maslow's hierarchy. Right. And now they realize, gosh, that could change in a second. That could change overnight. Mm. Right, the stuff that I depended on. Remember when Shanghai said just a few days before March 28th that there would be no citywide lockdown? Mm -hmm. You know, my compound was already in a lockdown when that when that you know an announcement was Mine made. Too. <laughs> yeah, and then and then on on we were let out what like March 27th for five hours or, or eight hours, like at 9 p.m. between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. They were like, go and buy your stock groceries. Yeah, go stock up. And I remember like going to going out to the corner grocery store and I was in a two hour line to pay for my groceries. And literally like I had stuff hanging off every shoulder, right? I had a flat of eggs on my hands, like <laughs> balancing it, sitting in the line, cutting off my circulation, you know, for two hours. And the lady in front of me, you know, older than me, right? And she was like, why are you buying so much? It's a four day lockdown. And I was like, mm. oh, you think it's a four day lockdown. <laughs> you <laughs> you poor know? soul. I was like, you don't look like you should be that naive, you know? Like, you look like you're from here. Well, at that you point, like Pudong was already overextended in the lockdown. We've been they went, locked down. Yeah. 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 And, and we were already over. And I was like, in what way do you think this is going to be a four-day lockdown? Just because they said so, you know? Um, but she was truly I like, thought it was going to be a four-day lockdown. Oh, you did? I, like, I, I wasn't even thinking. Yeah. I have a funny story that I can tell later about yeah. that. But yeah, luckily, like, you know, I have a smarter partner. <laughs> that knocks some sense yeah. into you. But I like I have a question for yeah. you. Um I you mentioned this ex existential thread and and like we know that there's this like Jo Ling Ho Ling Ling Ho yeah. generation. Yeah. Um like it, among your patient base, what can you share about um like your first hand experience talking to maybe this generation? And what their perceptions were, because is some of this kind of shaping what you're sharing with us now? You know, they're, they're different, right? They're different in terms of, you know, they grew up as only children and they grew up in stability and wealth, right? They grew up in a mm. China that um, their parents didn't grow up in. And they grew up in a China that we didn't grow up hearing about, right? From our, from mm. our parents. Mm. It's probably safe to say that all of us grew up in immigrant sort of immigrant families, right? In immigrant communities with immigrant mentalities. And the immigrant mentality is assuming, if you think about the experience of having to pick up either yourself or your whole family 
and move to a new place, right? Like that profound insecurity, right? So they, anybody mm. who's immigrated has been through this existential threat that, mm. that, that we're talking about. And these Jiu Ling Ho, Ling Ling Ho folks haven't. And it's not their fault. I mean, they are living the exact kind of life that their parents designed. Their parents worked their tails off in order to give them exactly that, right? So they would not have to touch with a 10-foot pole the feelings of insecurity. Um, but here it is. And it's discombobulating, right? It's jarring. It's, um, it's confusing. Like there's no... They haven't had the experience of being well adjusted to it, right? So they become yeah. they're 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 maladjusted to it in the sense that they're not conditioned. Well, they're not. It's not integrated into their worldview, mm. right? I think that it's integrated into the worldview of perhaps our parents, right? Who who had who had the experience of like I said, immigration, and 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 this profound insecurity, yeah. right? It wasn't a pleasant experience. But they've seen it before. Like of not knowing what tomorrow brings. Yeah, not knowing at all. And, and, and I think that's the, that was the main fear. Like, yeah. what does this mean for my future? Yeah. Right? What does this mean for all the plans that I had in my head about my like, five-year plan, my 10-year plan, my 20-year plan, right, that I was going to enact for me or for my kids? Like, what, what effect does that have, you know? Yeah. And, and um. There's a lot of fear, and human beings do not react well to fear. <laughs> so, like, you know? I'm I'm curious because it's like we were talking about something. This relates to it. Like my family, my parents, like the, went through this profound sense of insecurity, and like what I found was that like it's completely changed them, and it's in many ways ensured their survival because like they're just like always thinking ahead, always yep. planning. But like what plagues them and like, you know, I have relatives and parents, like, I mean, the 70s, like they haven't changed. They're, they're still like, everything is a threat to them. Mm. And, and I have a lot of that in me and then I'm triggered by it. And yeah. so like little tiny things, like like today I was telling Howie, it was like, I was talking to my, my lovely mom and <clears throat> it's like something so small and I had such a big reaction to it. I was getting all upset about it, you yeah. know? And so like this thing you're saying, um, about you know some of these folks like during the lockdown and like they don't know where these emotions are coming from. That like happens it happens to me all the time. Yeah, and I'm not like you know Joe Ling Ho. Yeah, you know? maybe I look. Well, like what, what are you? <laughs> what are you? <laughs> <laughs> if you're not Joe Ling Ho, yeah. what are you? I could pass for one, but um, so so that's like one thing. And then it's like Ho. So, <laughs> <Sling Ho. laughs> but I'm, what I'm curious is like, um, what are the ingredients that allow people? to be able to react really calmly because what I found is <laughs> like, so my wife's parents, um, they're a little bit younger than my parents, but they're like the progressive one and they're so calm. And like during the lockdown, we stayed, you know, we were at the in-laws and like her dad was just telling me like, you know, he, he told me the history of what's happened. So he's like, we've seen all this before. And like, yeah. you know, he wasn't happy about it, but he was very even keeled. And the way he raised his daughter was very even keeled. Like you got to be able to deal with shit. Yeah. But it wasn't like, always like scared. And the way I was raised was just like, basically tigers are coming out you every yeah. fucking day, yeah. like every day. So like, I have that in me. Like, what are the ingredients to help people? Because it doesn't feel like just going through that experience actually makes you good at dealing with it. Because if it was, my parents would be like, you know, they'd be like Fonzie, <laughs> right? But they're actually, hey. right? So it's, it's weird. It's like, I think, is, is some of it related to your disposition you're like, revealing your generation you by talking Fonzie. about Fonz. You know, just <laughs> just putting that out there. Like you, you mean like Happy Days Fonz? Right? I was. I'm talking about Pulp are, Fiction. Are t- yeah. Oh, yeah. you're talking about Pulp Fiction. No, 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 he's not. No, 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 he's not. No, he's trying to backtrack. Okay, 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 you're trying to backpedal. Okay. No, 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 I just want to make sure. Happy Days. Okay. Happy, we're no, talking about Happy Days. Ron Howard. It is. It is Happy Days, but I'm making the reference from Tim Roth. In the diner and Got Pulp Fiction, like, it. hey, what's Got Fonzie it. like? Fonzie, He's okay. cool. He's cool, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what you're what you're getting that still at still dates us. It, I think it still dates. You know what I'm it, it, like dates only you. it helps only. You, yeah, you haven't seen Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> no, okay. we're talking about Fonzie. <laughs> From the fucking Pulp Fiction. No, reference. we're not talking about Pulp Fiction. Okay, we're not talking about Pulp Fiction. All right. Okay. 
<laughs> well, I, I'm a teething hoe, right? So I'm I'm I I I think I admitted it already the last uh, the last episode, but um, you know it's so, so in mental health we have this thing called resilience, right? And it's this mysterious, you know. Okay, it's not that mysterious, but it's this je ne sais quoi. It's this um, it's this um, you know alien substance, right, that everybody <laughs> wants, right, that everybody <laughs> wants. It's a secret sauce, right? And it's what helps some people apparently thrive in constant change. Like some people apparently live for that and thrive in it, or maybe they don't like it, but they do well, right? They're somehow able to process through it in a way that is healthy and adaptive and advantageous to them, and they can use it. Um. And they're not afraid of it and they don't shy away from it. Whereas some people like, you know, it's, it's treated like the plague, right? Change. And, and, um, and, and this is the million dollar question. How do we develop resilience, right? Because like you said, going through something and constantly going through something or going through difficult times doesn't automatically mm. build that up, right? Are there different types of like resilience? Because like my mom is in some definitions of the word, extremely strong and resilient. Like, I mean, like when the yeah. when the going gets tough, like, I mean, she's going to rise to the occasion, yeah. but it stresses her out. She's always worried. Like when I think about resilience, like, I half think- Half kills her. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. And she's all stressed out and, and like, and then it creates anxiety over things that should not even be, they're not threats. Yeah. So it's always a threat. So it's, it is effective for her. But like, when I think about resilience, it's almost like, what you were saying, thriving, yeah, meaning that like I don't enjoy it, but I'm like my heart rate's down, but and I can I'm, deal I'm able with to, it. I can deal with it. She yeah. can deal with it, but the side effects is it tears it apart, and like I feel like I have some of that. You so know? physiologically, the heart rate is not down. So in people who, so let's just talk about physically first. What people resilient people, what it looks like. Mm -hmm. The heart rate is not down. The muscles are not relaxed, right? They're still constricted. You're you're still like sort of in this fight or flight, fight or flight, right? You're you're but you know, and 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 your breathing is faster and everything. But the way that you conceptualize that or perceive that is different. So physiologically, what what actually ends up happening, and there is research um, uh, on this, is that all of that is still as a case, but your blood vessels are less constricted, right? Your blood is flowing. Your blood vessels mm. are less constricted, although your heart is pumping. And that's actually the same physiological response that we observe in joy and exhilaration and courage, right? Like your heart is pumping when you're really happy, yeah. right? And when you're really excited, excited, like in a good way, but, um, but you're relaxed. You, I mean, you don't feel stressed out, yeah. but you're doing, and maybe you are breathing faster and maybe your muscles are actually kind of tight. But but you're yeah. feeling that qualitatively in a different way, and 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 the perception I think people with resilience um, um, perceive things differently, right? So so for example, um, people re with resilience say, "Hey, what can I do? What element of control do I have in this?" As opposed to being completely overwhelmed by what is outside of their control, which is a lot, yeah. right? Like 99.9% .9 of things, but their mind and, and eyes and and everything they mean, everything they turn their face literally towards is toward that 0.1% that is within their control. What can I do? What do I do now? Even their, per, even their perception of what's happening within themselves right now. Like a person without that much resilience would probably say something like, oh gosh, I'm so stressed out right now. This is really bad. It's really bad for me, right? It's not good that we're in a lockdown. It's not good that I'm stressed out about it. It's not good that, you know, none of this is good. Whereas a person with resilience would be more likely, likely to say, look, this is not that great, but what's my response mm -hmm. to it? This is appropriate. What I'm feeling right now is getting me ready. Right. Yeah. I don't, I still don't know what to do. Like the path is still not clear. Yeah. I still don't know how to get on group buys. I still don't know whether I can, you know, whether I can get that that food, you know, for tomorrow. But what's happening within me isn't bad. This is normal. This is expected. Whether that's expected because, hey, I've seen it before, or this has happened before, or I've heard stories about this or whatever, or because, you know, for some other reason, but they're able to 
look and and conceptualize what's happening within themselves mm-hmm. differently, not so much what's happening outside of themselves. Well, yeah. I can right. I can totally relate to that because during the lockdown, a lot of the conversations I had um, with some people was like the sky is falling. Mm-hmm. The sky is absolutely falling. falling. This is the I'm end. Com- this is the end. I'm completely freaking out. Mm-hmm. People are dying. And for some reason or another, I don't know. There's just, I was kind of like what you were saying. I'm not going to call myself resilient. I really don't know how resilient I actually am. But for some reason or another, I was not as phased with the mm-hmm. lockdown. And that was mistaken by some people for thinking like, oh, I don't think this is a big deal. You don't care about people who are struggling. Mm-hmm. Like, of course I do. And of course this is a big deal and this sucks. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I was kind of looking around and at least looking around the people that were in my close circle, people I love, family mm-hmm. members, and myself, my own experience, and was like, and just objectively looking like, okay, this this sucks. We have to, it's a lockdown. Of course it sucks. But it's really not that bad for me Mm -hmm. Um, and for the people I know directly. And I did not have this whole sky is falling panic attack. Um, And I kind of brushed it off in a way where it's like, yeah, let's just bite the bullet. Mm -hmm. You know, this is our turn. I I even said this in in one of our podcasts, like this is our turn. Let's bite the bullet and, you know, do what you got to do. But, you know, uh, there there will be light at the end of the tunnel. I don't believe yeah. this will be forever. And and it was tough having that conversation and seeing kind of like the different reactions people had with that in terms of, you know, thinking like, well, no, this is a huge deal. You need yeah. to be freaking out right now. You need to be really pissed off. And I'm like, well, what, what good does that do me? Yeah. Like, what good does that do? Yeah. And I'm going to at least try to control what I can. And knowing that this whole thing sucks, but kind of kind of mentality and pushing through and where I didn't kind of go into that really deep, dark hole that probably may- maybe many people went through during the lockdown. So, well, well, I have a quick question on this one, right? Yeah. Like, um, so like this, this inner narrative um, that Justin's talking about, it's like the story that we're telling ourselves because we're constantly telling ourselves stories, right? We're like characterizing this as you were saying earlier like the way people character characterize their situation can be very very different and in resilient people it's very different so we keep telling ourselves these stories they're related to probably the stories our parents are telling us i've heard this referred to as invisible scripts secret rules sure um saboteurs yeah. like whatever it is right what determines um like what the the story that people tell themselves like what goes into that and then it feels like probably your work is to help people tell a different story. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think what, what, so, so if, if we take what Justin just said as, as, as one of these narratives, right. And, and, and that, that, that is, that's not resilience in and of itself. It's what grows out of it. It's what can grow out of it. Right. And that's, that's, that's one of the manifestations of it. Although it doesn't have to be that right. Resilience can manifest itself in, in in many, many different ways. So it's not necessarily the case that the people that you're talking to that are feeling really, really negatively about the lockdown are not resilient. And the people who are feeling more positively about it um, are, right? That's not necessarily the case, right? And, and I, I want to put that out there. I was a part of these, you know, a lot of group chats, you know, as we all were. During the lockdown, I think my my like the number of group chats that I participated in doubled or something, <laughs> you know, uh, during the lockdown. But um, but you know, there's a lot of like this talk going on where some people were, were were trying to say, hey, you know, let's look on the bright side. It's not that bad. It's gonna there's a light, you know, things like that. And I think a lot of people felt really negatively about that. A lot of people felt like almost offended. Yeah, yeah. Like kind of maybe that, that, that was negating their experience. There's a mm. term called like that people were throwing around called toxic positivity. Yeah. Like you're just being toxically positive. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and because of that positively, I'm feeling like my, my true experience of fear or of anxiety isn't being recognized. And in fact, I'm getting the finger pointed at me because I'm sort of not feeling that positivity about a it. Lack of empathy right? in a way. I mean, well, yeah. And, and that's not, you know, I mean, the person being positive is also expressing his or her own true 
experience, right? They're not trying to, you know, uh, you know, purposefully negate anybody. But it's like two people talking over each other, though, right? Because yeah. the, like it's fine, toxic, like the positivity. But like I, I heard that, and then I like for me, it was like I realized that everyone was going through a different experience, and I was like, if you look at different segments of society, COVID really heightens that. So yeah. like if you were in the bottom ten percent, oh my like, gosh. now you're in the bottom point. 1%, right? And so I realized that like I was fortunate for a lot of different reasons. Absolutely. And, and I started seeing people that like could not deal with the toxic po positivity or the positivity. And it would frustrate me. I'm like, why are you being so negative, right? It, it, inside, because these are really dear friends of mine. And so I didn't public, like I didn't criticize them, right? Yeah. I'm just thinking this. Yeah. And then it like dawned on me that like, wow, they must be going through something different, right? So I started asking questions and I started saying, okay, like, tell me what it's like and why are you feeling this way? Because like, if you don't acknowledge feelings, people will just like, they'll get louder and louder. And so the more opportunities we can give those around us in big and small ways to voice that, to, to what we call validate it, right? Or to make the other person feel like what they're going through is a valid experience, even if it's different from, you know, anybody else, um, that has a strengthening effect that has a resilience building effect, you know? So, so what you're, what, what, what you're talking about is actually really, really related to, to resilience. And it's, it's part of what we do, mm -hmm. right. As mental health people is that we try to put out the message, particularly particularly during a difficult time like the one that we're going through right now. And I think today is a particularly insecure time, right, for much of Shanghai, right? Mm -hmm. We're doing, you know, testing of probably the majority of the city, I think, if not the whole yeah. city. Mass testing. Mass a lot testing. of cities are going through this too, right? Yeah. Now. And the big question is what's going to happen what's when the next, results, what's next, what's next right? Yeah, are we going back into Are we lockdown? going back in? Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah, yesterday I went to grocery stores and stuff is already, gone. you know, gone, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? And so, I mean, I was at a grocery store yesterday and it, it was a normal groceries shop. Like it was a normal grocery shopping time for me. And I was like, gosh, should I actually be buying double right now? Mm. Like just in Did case. Did you? Did right? you buy double? Uh yeah. <laughs> I didn't buy double, but I will say that we have not, I, I bought more <laughs> and I, I will say that, you know what, we haven't completely let off the group buys, yeah. even though yeah. we're out of lockdown, right? Like, do I need 14 yeah. bags of Tyson chicken breast? Well, no, <laughs> but. Yeah. What, what, is that, what is that term called? Like, like stockpiling? Hoarding. Or hoarding. hoarding. <laughs> I, I was talking to my mom and then like, the, like this was months back and then, you know, and I was like. Um, you know, I think. Wait, hold on. I just have to say this. Every everything you've said this entire podcast has been about your mom. Has been about your mom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> every single yeah. thing has been well, about your and mom. That, and Dr. that's said in front of a psychologist, I so I don't know. She's like, no, 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 no. Doctor George, like, um, I mean, I don't want this to. That we can, we can, you know, I, I could pay you off air. Um, I got no, in. We'll pay you. I got. Off air. I got into an. I, I wouldn't say an argument. I would say I was highly critical and judgmental of her this morning for not being able to perform certain tasks on her iPad to my expectations. And then like later in the call, I'm like berating her for not knowing how to use her iPad because I'm trying to show her a feature. So I felt really bad because I usually don't do that. But then it was a little thing like you were saying before that had this big reaction and I've been thinking about it all day. Yeah. Right? And so you feel guilty why, about that, it? Yeah. Then that's that's why I kind of uh, came up. But when you said the hoarding thing, I just thought about her because she was like, no, I'm not hoarding. She's like, I'm just, you know, accumulating supplies. Like, you know, she yeah. <laughs> she's like, what's the word? I'm like, I don't know, stockpile. So she made a clear distinction that she was not a hoarder. She was stockpile. She was, sto <laughs> she was just stock being, she was like preparing. Yeah. And and you know what? I mean, that's a different perspective, right? That's a different <laughs> uh you know, way to frame it, we say. Right? Yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. In, in in psychology. Um, but you know, I think I think one of the things we have to recognize is that a lot of resources that we have internally, just like external resources, are finite. And 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 that includes things like frustration tolerance, what we call frustration tolerance, the, the ability of, of a person to tolerate frustration, right? That includes emotion regulation, 
right? How we can feel an emotion and regulate it and pull it back in the moment when we feel like, oh gosh, this this emotion is not necessarily appropriate for whatever reason in this context. So I'm going to either put it down or or dial it back a couple notches right that takes something out of you that 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 this that ability is is expensive quote unquote and and those abilities those resources are finite and so if it's used up by one thing there's less of it available for something else right and if it's been used it's been constantly used up over the last two and a half slash three months right in big and small ways maybe not in overtly obvious ways, but it has. It's been gradually eaten up. And so now we're coming out of it, hopefully, right? But we need to build up those resources, right? And that takes Mm. time, right? That takes time. That takes intentionality. And so, um, you know, I can understand, right? It sounds like for you and your mom, like there was something that was, you know, what started, you know, the, the, the argument with your mom and what happened there um, the, the way that you lost or became frustrated or lost your temper at her probably started way before the conversation with your mom ever started, right? Yeah, it started yeah. with something else that that reduced your internal resources so that there was just less yeah. left over. Well, just like with patience, your patience can wear thin, right? People always yeah, say pati- that. Or you call it patience, yeah. which I think is frustration tolerance, yeah. right? But, <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. It's, it's different. And it's what, like, for example, it's what, like, like for me, I will be open and say that I've become angrier, like I lose my temper so much more easily, which is a bad thing when you have two young kids, right? But um, I lose my temper so much more easily now because I think over the last few months and maybe a couple years, like it's been, you know, that resource has gradually been depleted. Eroded, yeah. yeah, depleted or eroded and, and hasn't necessarily been replenished as quickly or as regularly or as, as well, right? And I haven't, you know, especially in my profession, right? You, I love what I do, but you talk to people in the deepest, darkest times of their lives. Yeah. And, and we all try to draw boundaries internally, right? There's, you know, in, in order to make sure that we have enough left for the next person who's waiting outside in the waiting room and your family, after, you know, and, 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 and yourself, but, but we're all, we're all not always that good at it. Right. And I'm not that good at it. And so, um, I, you know, I feel this profoundly too. How are you going to say anyway, something? Anyway, sorry. I lost my train of thought. Obviously. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. What are your thoughts? Like, how do you, how can you relate to this? Yeah, Mr. Sunshine. <laughs> are you Mr. Sunshine? Oh, your oh, shirt. Yeah, a shirt that says Mr. Sunshine. No, I was just thinking about um, what you were saying uh, on how you, you, you were personally affected. Um, because I'm just reflecting on myself as well during this whole time on how I've changed you know from this lockdown and what justin mentioned before what he went through yeah and i was just thinking about like all the different people that i was i was speaking with recently and how different everybody had reacted to what the past yeah. three months you know yeah went through and what i want what i want to ask you is how do how does somebody reflect on it and like this whole process and reflect on their changes that they've gone through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you were saying, you're getting angrier, you know? The truth is, is that I have a lot to be grateful for and I can put, turn my focus on that. Right. And that's what I've been trying to do. That's one of the ways that I've been trying to replenish myself and to see what that means. Mm-hmm. Like what, what would, what would some increased gratitude for myself mean? Right, not gratitude, not that I'm grateful for myself, but I mean, (laughs) increased gratitude in myself. What would that mean? What would that translate to? How would that manifest or look like? Right, I'm trying to take it there. And that's one way I'm trying to combat, Mm. you know, uh, the negative or the deleterious effects that I'm seeing within myself. Like on that one, George, like I, if I'm in a stressed out mode, I can be like, okay, you got to be grateful. And then, you know, the other side of me says, fuck you. I don't want to be grateful. I just want to be a dick. I don't feel like it. Right? So how do you, it's almost like only when you're in the mind state, you can activate the process, but then you're already in a good mood. So it's like when you're in a really bad mood and you're really messed up, how do you activate this chain to like Well, we're talking about resilience, right? We're talking, Mm -hmm. building resilience is a long-term thing. It doesn't just happen in the moment. 
it's not an like building resilience isn't an event. It's got to be sort of mm. a lifestyle. So you're right. When when you're stressed out and when you're really really feeling it, maybe that's not the time right now to like go to gratitude, right? <laughs> you can't, right?、Mm. That's the time for self care. That's the time for empathy. That's the time for 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 someone to say no. It makes sense why you're feeling that way. If you were right? to go right、sense. to positivity or gratitude. Would that be an example of toxic positivity, or do feel, you even believe in? Toxic it could feel. To- I mean, I think toxic. The I mean, toxic is a word that depends on your perspective,、mm. right? I, I think it depends on your perspective. That's like a pejorative. That's not fair either. It, it、right? could feel. That's like、toxic. the other side、well, because there's judging, toxic negativity too. Yeah, then, I mean,、right? <laughs> anything can be toxic, right?、Yeah. If if you're not prepared for that, or if you feel like it negates your experience, right? Then you feel like it's poisonous to to you.、Mm. Like it's not helping. It feels judgmental, because now I feel like I'm not good enough because I'm not feeling positive like you're feeling. I'm feeling kind of crappy, right? So what you need in that moment isn't that. What you need in that moment is empathy. Like、mm. no, I, it makes sense why you're feeling so crappy. It sucks when you don't feel understood. Then your defenses come up, right? And you you start you start you know putting up your dukes and you you,、mm. you start fighting. But if you feel understood, even if that understanding is you toward yourself, then you're、mm. then you could be more open to the next thing, which is, gosh, how could I have handled that differently, though? And I think this actually has a lot to do with our lockdown because research is showing, research has shown,、um, you know, my research colleagues at NYU Shanghai, at PKU Peking University, Wang Junhe pointed this out,、um, that that. When people experience lockdown, and this is primarily data out of 2020 in Wuhan, when people felt taken care of, they felt that reduced the psychological effects, right? The negative psychological effects of the lockdown. Now there are profound differences too, right?、Uh, other differences in that, you know, Wuhan 2020. I think the residents of Wuhan had a way to understand the lockdown and its necessity that was different from Shanghai 2022, right? I think that's. That's a big difference that we have to have to put out there, and that also has an effect on the way that we respond to it psychologically, right? Because if we can understand its necessity, that actually can turn up our resilience. Well, because it, we kind of we kind of feel it's kind of justified almost, in, in, well, for and, lack of a better word. Yeah, and you're taking it for the team, right? The the, the Wuhan twenty. I mean, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories about. Origin theories and things like that, but you know, Wuhan 2020 is the epicenter, and so the people of Wuhan felt like, "Hey, this is what we have to do." Well, also the biggest difference between they they didn't know what it what it yeah, really it and was. it was much more fatal,、yeah. and it was an unknown. That that's a really good point. It was unknown. People were dying. A lot、yeah. of people were dying. The hospitals were getting overwhelmed. There was a huge amount of fear. But here you have a lot of people talking about, "Well, it's 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 just well, it's not as deadly. Well,、right? that's Omicron. That's and I've said this."、Um, You know, since the beginning, I, I just feel like of the lockdown. I feel like I think what made it even worse was psychologically, especially like what you're saying, is the timing of the of, of this most recent lockdown that we went through in Shanghai, because it what we had it so good for quite a long time, yeah, and we felt like we kind of got over the hump, got over the hurdle.、Yeah. We feel like. We kind of beat this virus, right?、Yeah. And Shanghai has been pretty good at controlling this, and we've been able to live relatively normal lives. And then this happens; it really felt like we took a huge step back. Yeah. And psychologically, that really that that does a lot of damage. I think had this Shanghai lockdown, the same one we just went through, occurred while Wuhan was also going through it back in 2020. I think there probably would have been much more understanding, even、sure. with the chaos, even with the mismanagement that we've witnessed. I think there still would have been more, I guess, resilience, maybe more patience with it. Sure. Than it happening now. I agree.、Yeah. I agree. And 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 we only were only what ten days after after the release, and so there's 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 you know profound questions about how this recovery is going to look, right? I mean, one day. <laughs> One one lost day of Shanghai productivity is more than I don't know. Like I mean, Shanghai is bigger than a lot of countries, countries、yeah. right? And the economy here is bigger than a lot of countries, you know. And 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 I'm not an economist, so I won't even venture to guess. But I'm not stupid. I mean, it's huge.
mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I think we we still, I mean, you know, and we didn't, like you said, we didn't even feel this way in the throes of 2020, right? We were still going out to eat and leaving our compounds and living normal lives, right? Aside from Disneyland being closed for a couple months, like mm-hmm. it was, you know, it was pretty normal. And I think it's also, you know, we have to also make a note that, you know, this goes back to the whole privilege thing is, you know, the lockdown is kind of, well, at least hopefully it's over for us. But for a lot of people, it's not entirely over in the sense that there's still a lot of businesses that haven't been able to open. Yeah. And that will probably never will. Yeah. Well, like there's, you know, like, you know, I have friends who own bars here. Yeah. Right. And they still can't open. And, you know, this is their livelihood. That's their business they depend on. So while they're able to leave their houses, you know, yeah. from a financial and, and, and career perspective, like they're still locked down. And, and it's not over. And, and it feels negating to, I think, a lot of us in Shanghai to feel, to, to hear that like the lockdown, quote unquote, is over. Because mm-hmm. sometimes you're like, no, it hasn't, you know, for me. And it, and it feels really negating like what is there a message is there a narrative out there that this is over because it's not over right and you you know you feel like you want to shout it well one of my um past guests jamie dixon again he he said something that really resonated with me he's he says conflict arises when two people try to force their stories onto each other Mm -hmm. and this is on a more petty note but i think a lot of like maybe the heated discussions and debates and even arguments whether it's in these WeChat groups or face to face or, you know, with with your friends, is kind of people trying to force their perspective and their experience onto one another. Yeah. Instead of just seeing it like, well, two can exist at the same time. I might not have it so bad. At the same time, you might have it really bad. Yeah. Right. And those two don't conflict with each other. They just coexist because of the wide dynamic range of experiences. Yeah. You know, before you were talking about like pos- a toxic positivity, and I believe there is some truth in that, that people can be kind of blindly positive to, to almost their detriment. Um, but I also feel like there is, at least in my experience, when I was trying to like go through this lockdown myself and... I was trying to find ways to improve myself and improve my outlook and and just try to be more resilient throughout the lockdown, knowing full well that this sucks and a lot of people don't have it as good as me. But then I feel like when you're talking to people, they're almost trying to push that onto you and be like, no, you can't feel good about yourself because I'm not feeling good yeah. about myself. Yeah. And that's that's the thing I had a problem with. And yeah. The first thing I would always ask anybody that I spoke to was like, oh, are you getting food? Are yeah. you getting water? Like, what, what's your situation? Right? I never ignored their situation. And for the most part, I found that after I asked them these questions, their situation was actually very similar to mine. Yeah, They could eat. They could get water. You know, they weren't in any like immediate imminent danger of, of really survival, let's say. But then what they would do, they, they would forward me like a social media video. Right, yeah. that is going viral. Yeah, and then we're like, take a look at this, take a look at that. Like, what is your agenda here? Like, are you trying to just? It, it's a clash of kind of two different stories rubbing up against each other. Yeah, and that's where I feel like people are trying to influence each other. Be like, no, you should have my outlook about this, and other people are like, no, we should have my outlook about this. Well, the way that I view that is less about is less about. I think no, I want to bring you around to my side. It's more that I want company. Right, I want to feel less alone in what I'm feeling, whether or not that is good or bad. Right, maybe I'm feeling more positive about it. Maybe I'm ne- not. Maybe I'm feeling more negative about it. But I want to feel less alone in it. And so I'm almost like trying to convince you to go. Uh oh, I feel that way too. Then, oh, now that I've seen the video, I feel that way too. You're, you know, or something. Right, because that instant when they feel like. When you say, oh, I feel the same way you do, there's something about that that feels good to people. Like right? cathartic almost. It's, it, it makes you feel less alone. And I think that's how we're wired, right? We're wired to seek connection. We're wired also to enjoy simplicity, which is why it feels better to cast these black and white 
judgments on whether it was good or bad, right? And we, we, we have always as humans enjoyed the simplicity and have not always been that adjusted to the nuance, right? Of, of, and, or the complexity and, um, to our detriment. And that's something that resilient people can do. So bringing it back to what does resilience, resilience mean and how can we, how can we develop it? Um, I think it's learning and becoming accustomed to pointing out, to highlighting the nuance, the flexibility. It's, it's a cognitive, it is a cognitive process. It's, it's this cognitive flexibility that I can see things from more than one way and I can feel comfort when it's not clearly one or the other. You know, when something exists in between or the whole, it depends, my tolerance of ambiguity, right? I think that's profoundly connected to it. And, and, and here living in China, I think that we have had to, in many ways, tolerate more ambiguity, you know, in life here than as compared to other places. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And so um, I think there's, you know, uh, something connected to resilience there you know, as well, mm. right, that we can, we can develop. Yeah, there are a few things that you said that are really helpful. Like, you know, we're wired to, like, believe in one narrative, right? And so, like, when we're sending it's more video, comfortable. it's more comfortable. Like, I find myself, like, trying to, like, have, like, one version of everything, and that's why my mind is always... Because it's like, easier to understand, right? Well, we like consistency, yeah, right? And, and we like, you know, there's this... There's this um, term, you know, called cognitive dissonance, when we can't hold two things that apparent, well, like when two things, you know, apparently um, conflict with each other, our psyche must make them consistent. And we'll go through a variety of mental gymnastics and twists and turns in order to just make it fit. And it's not so discombobulating mm. psychologically, yeah. right? And it's a way to preserve sanity. Yeah, I could see why we would want clarity because clarity would lead to speed of decision. And then in yeah. terms of survival, like you could react really quickly. Um, and, you know, like you said, we don't, we tend to cast these like black or white judgments. So like, I think it's like, we're unable to hold these conflicting views. And I think like, then I think like the asking questions, like I found myself, it was like, it was more like, rather than um, judging something, it was like asking questions and like, for instance, if people are kind of like unhappy with how things are being run. So I would just ask myself, well, what are the decision filters that the powers that be are using to determine the strategy? Like I try to become them and I'd be mm. like, wow, it's a really complex thing. Because wow. like, okay, like, okay, I if I if I let it all go, then like a million people will die. More I than don't million, know that I do that a lot, but yeah, I can see. I, right? I do do that some, yeah. And then, and I, and I was just like, well, what are the decision filters, right? Like, and 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 so rather than making um, a lot of like definitive statements, because I just realized I didn't know anything, and so like a lot of the negativity is generated by when you're just like, okay, this is fucked up. Yeah, or the government is doing this, or this is bad, or this and is just bad. being very it's, judgmental. Yeah, yeah, being judgmental. It's which is fine. I get it, but it's just like I just didn't have enough information. Yeah, I mean, I get it. I do, and 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 this is hard, you know. And and it's hard too because um, I slash we right are in this interesting um, situation, right, where we are we are foreigners, we're Americans, but we're living here, right. And so, and and, and this I think is a broader issue, not just with COVID. I think it's an issue with so much stuff geopolitically, right? Especially with like China, U S relations where we feel like we have like one foot in, 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 in both, right? Not just mm. physically and geographically, but ideologically, like we, we sort of straddle the fence and that's not comfortable. I think at no, least it's, it's, it's not it's, for me. I'm so glad that you brought this <laughs> because this is exactly why I wanted to to, to bring in yeah. um, that identity, right? Because recently, yes, oh, yesterday, uh, I was in my office yeah. and speaking with my coworkers, and uh, we were talking about how we have all been, how have we all been reacting to these three months, two, three months, yeah. right? And so me as an American and the only one that's a foreigner in my office, 
and I'm sharing my thoughts and about you know you know uh, how I've kind of changed from th- this past three months. And the biggest response I got from the local community of my office was, "Well, you're an American. You can always leave. You know, you, it's not like us. We're trapped here. You know, or something along those lines. Where you know, basically just getting like just negating anything that I fe- I feel because I can always run away. You know, yeah, and, American privilege. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is weird because I never really thought that way or felt that way before." Mm. You know, yeah. and we were kind of, you know, before going on air, we were discussing a little bit about this sort of cross cultural um, yeah. uh, identity that we have, yeah. being American or American raised, but living here and Chinese. Yeah. So yeah, it's just I'm so glad that you brought that up. Because and when you said Chinese, complex. when you said Chinese, you pointed at your face because like looking Chinese, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, it, it, it is such an interesting situation to be in, particularly during these times, right? And, and again, like I said, not just with COVID, just with so many, you know, East versus West, US versus China, right? Like we have never been in, at least not in my lifetime, like, it, like the, the kind of complicated uh, relational, politically speaking, like relational environment right between the two countries that we know and love so i think this is this is this is really hard and i think it it also has to do with what we are talking about in terms of our um the way that we see covid because subconsciously right i think it it is it is it is uh it hits upon that right this complicated the complicated emotions that we feel about um, what it means to be both American and Chinese, right? What it means to really feel like you have roots in in both, right? What it feels like when when you, when you feel like you have loyalty to both. Like we, I, I think that many of us in this situation, we're staunch defenders of like both places, yeah. <laughs> right? And we're like staunch defenders of both places. Like you know, we're defenders of China when we go back to the States and we're defenders of China when we of the States when we're over here and we're, you know, and it would be hypocritical. It would be hypocritical not to be right. Like, like it would totally, it feels like me to be like hypocrisy. If like I'm with, let's say I'm in the U S and I'm with like non-Chinese people and then they start criticizing Chinese people. And for me to like talk shit, it's like, <laughs> like I have thousands of years of you know, DNA from yeah, China. Yeah. It doesn't come from the US. It comes from China. Like, like I can do that, but you can't. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And and like, like so, I can like I the N word. I can <laughs> for black people. Right? Yeah. Like I can speak negatively about my parents, but you can't. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. like yeah. I know them and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. Or like and and even so, like, I mean, like, you know, I feel I would feel uncomfortable at this point having spent so much time in China and and, and connecting back you know, to, to kind of in some spiritual way, like my identity, um, like criticizing China in general, because that's like your identity, right? Like you, you've got hundreds of generations that you come from that lived here that, that, you know, culturally are from here. And then you have like one or two generations in the U S at the same time, I grew up in that U S environment and it's shaped me, right? philosophically, mentally, like it shaped me culturally in a, in a in the most profound way because I am a product of that environment directly. That generation is directly a product. I eat hamburgers, pizza, yeah. whatever it is, all these complex, the way, like we're very American and we're like how direct we are. Yeah. The way that I would process information is like very American. Yeah, and, 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 and what, what I'm most... You know, what I have the most difficult time with is I think the way that, again, I think this goes back to how we love simplicity, but we have to put everything in this binary spectrum where it's like China bad, American good, or something like that, right? Where everything has to be like in the way that maybe, you know, uh, I grew up in the late 70s, early 80s, right? Where there's the Cold War 
and everything like Russian was Russian like bad. <laughs> Russian bad. And well, maybe, it's maybe still we're back there. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we've come back to that a little bit, you know, um, it's, really, or, or it's, full, it's still but, totally but, bad. But, like, no, but it's, like, but we grew up like, like that, right? Like doing Putin, yeah. Putin bad. Remember, no, but like, that's what I was talking about in the beginning about this a subconscious layer of messaging. But I think, I, I think what you just said is really profound a second ago when you said Putin bad, because I think we now with the 21st century, um, sensitivities right now kind of draw a distinction we don't say russia bad we say putin bad right because we're like oh wait now hold up right there's a difference between leadership and people or there's like we're trying to be more nuanced well not everyone it. is as nuanced as not, that. not everyone is yeah but i think that that there is a voice mm. though for that that we didn't hear in the early 80s right like during like I mean, maybe a little bit when like, I don't know if, okay, I don't know how old everyone is, but you know, during like glass, what is it? Glasnost and Perestroika and you know, the, the whole Gorbachev era, I think there was a little bit more nuance kind of injected into the conversation. But, um, you know, I, and, and, and that's where I think I want to go where like we highlight this, this nuance where, where it's not like we are defenders, but we understand, we understand the way Hey, the, the the decisions that the Americans made are because of the way Americans think, the history, the whole direction of the way that that country developed, right? And we talked about this a little bit during our last one, like, and the narratives that are perpetuated and glorified, right, in 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 lore, and and in history, in the West, and also the concept of like manifest destiny and expansion and exploration and there's this whole sort of like direction and then the, the, you know there's there's you know it has its roots in, in in western civilization way before america obviously but 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 there is that whereas over here in the east it's it's so it's so different right what has been glorified and the values that have been here in this place for for millennia are different right and we also have an understanding of that because it's passed down to us from our from our parents and the stories and the narratives that we we heard growing up, yeah. right? Which for me was like the romance of the three kingdoms and 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 these tales. It's it's so deep in your psyche and like it the, is. I mean, it, it, like the thing is like number one, I think what you're saying is that who you are determines ninety five percent of what you think. And so like by who you are, what do you mean? Like like if you were born in the US, you were born in China, right? Like so if basically who like where you were born and where you grew up is the main determinant of your beliefs, then who can say that any beliefs are absolutely good or bad? And we see this Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. When you look at the political scene in the US, when you look at um like if you were you know, if you grew up as a Caucasian versus African American versus Asian. So like, yeah. to me, it's dawned for a very long time that my beliefs are very much like 90%, a 95% product are a product of just like- Your environment. Th they're a product of the uncontrollables, let's put it that way. And there's like 5%, maybe even less that I can control. So how can I say with any kind of certainty that any of this stuff has a right or wrong, and it doesn't. And then, then you look at like most of the root causes of the problems in the world, and I'm, it's all based on the fact that like we just can't step into each other's shoes. It's yeah. like I was born with these shoes, you were born with these shoes, right? And very few people trade shoes for other shoes. But we have to. It's almost like that we have this human drive to cast things in right or wrong. Yeah, right. We have to almost in order to make sense of it and to make. To Enemy. feel well, we have to know who's like who to yeah who to like let into your it's village. The, it's and the who other to not. rising, right? It's the other rising, right? We mm. we view the other as as bad, right? And view, we view the other as less superior, right? Like for example, the COVID, right? The U.S. and the and the and China have had very different philosophical approaches to COVID in their response, and it's almost like we have to view the other as bad. Right? There's always got to be... Order, or yeah. one is absolutely right and one is absolutely yeah. wrong. There always has yeah. to be a good and an evil. As opposed, when it's just somewhere probably in between. As opposed to being a lot more nuanced about it and saying it depends. 
because that's really, really uncomfortable for people. Like, what do you mean? It depends. What does this mean though? Like how safe, how, what, how do I know what I'm going to do? And, and we saw this, and I saw this in conversations in the States and people are like, I'm confused. Should I wear my mask or not? Should I like, you know, do this one minute you're supposed to like do that one, the other minute you can't. And it's always changing. And I'm like, yeah, cause you know what? It changes, right? It does. And, and people are so, um, profoundly uncomfortable with that, right? And they, they, they have to just go, no, then that's effed up and that's messed up, right? If it changes, then it must be wrong, yeah. right? It must be wrong. I can't trust it. And you're like, no, no, that's I life. mean, that's the nature of the beast. Well, that's and science. That's, but I feel like that's, you're going science, to, that's sort of everything. But you're going through, you're going into a lot of different personality types. And mm. that's one of the things that I keep facing. If I'm going to relate it to something more recent, um, which is going through this lockdown, and dealing, you know, living with my wife mm -hmm. during this time and having these more in-depth arguments or <laughs> conversations um, and and trying to understand why we have that conflict or of, yeah. of you know, differing opinions or whatever, right? And it's just, it goes just goes down to not just we are the product of our environment, but also our personality types. Of being able to be empathetic to the other person, yeah. or being able to, you know, think outside the box or not, you know. And I caught myself many times not being able to jump out, and all of a sudden be like, "Wait, why am I not jumping out of this?" You know, uh, of a thought or something like that. You know. So it's just like there's there's this nuance of personality types that I guess I think it just all depends on who you are and who you're dealing with, and and yeah. once you understand that, then changing how you react. Right. I I think it also you know, and I got to bring the concept, I think, of power and privilege back to this too. And so when, when you're talking about your, your, um, your arguments or, or conversations with your wife, right. And I don't want to get too personal, but is your wife, is your wife Chinese? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so like Chinese from China, like grew up in China and, yes. and things like that. Okay. So, so, and, and obviously you're male and she's female. And so like historically, right. There's an interplay here of power and privilege, right. Where that power has been centered on a Western male situation. And, and, and particularly, you know, we're, we're having, again, this conversation in China, we're having this conversation in the East, in Asia, right. Which is a, a, a place of profound history and, 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 and cultural and civil, you know, you know, cultural advancement and civilization, but it's also been a place that's been heavily victimized and colonized and it's gone through and we're sitting in Shanghai, famously partitioned, right? And, and all of that. So I think, you know, that history also goes along with, you know, is part and parcel and plays into how people react, right? People are a product of their surroundings, but they're also a product of this cultural and historical narrative of those surroundings, right? That has a lot of power and privilege played into it. So as an Eastern Asian female, she has probably felt historically at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the Western colonizing male, mm -hmm. right? Oh, the but Western... she, she definitely has the power in that relationship. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, not, a... I'm not saying particularly. <laughs> she wears okay. the pants in the house, right, not right. Howie. Let's just make that clear. <laughs> and, and Howie is the beta. Got it. You're the beta. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Howie is pantsless. <laughs> what are pants? What, what are, are pants? pants? What are those things? Um, He's no, got a but... whole collection of dresses. I see. <laughs> But I mean, even, even in the way that we're characterized, I think that it plays into, you know, power and privilege. And I think for a long time, right, China has felt, um, not just China, right, but many parts of the world have felt, I mean, for lack of a better word, like the, the word chifu comes into my mind, right, bullied. which I guess means bullied, right? Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, uh, uh, but but for some reason, chifu carries much more of a emotional like weight to it i don't know maybe it's because i don't know because of because the way chifu up, but... is written chifu is a word from the perspective of the victim yeah whereas bully is from the perspective of the bullier ah maybe I, that's I mean why. I, I just thought of that i don't yeah. know if it's true yeah i don't know but you know but somehow chifu feels much more like emotionally impactful it's like victimized yeah yeah there's some sort of, and and i think that um there is a view in China, that 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 the U.S. Um, 
that the U.S. wants to preserve its hegemony, right? That the that the U.S. has 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 enjoyed its hegemony and wants to preserve it, and I don't think that's false, right? Like I, I think it's pretty it's, pretty it's, clear. I mean, it's it's one hundred percent true power, because if you read all of the like, if and you read the the actual comments from Anthony Blinken, if you read the different committees that Congress has formed to look at U.S. Yeah. competitive advantage. And it's vilifying yeah. Yeah. China. Well, it depends on the nuance, sure, right? Sure, But I think, like, number one is that, you know, clearly the U.S. wants to maintain its dominance. And sure. I don't blame them in this, you know, look at sports well, teams. I mean, if I were any dominant, country, any, any country, every country yeah, in that position, you? any I mean, country in that position would want yeah, to maintain yeah, its yeah, dominance. Yeah, yeah. If I were dominant about anything, I'd want to maintain yeah. it. Well, There's also the question, I mean, I'm not a political science scientist, but are we, are we moving away from the world where there is one hegemon, right? Where for millennia there has been, right? Like there has been, you know, for a long time it was the UK, right? And UK was, I mean, you know, England was the hegemon, right? England controlled half the world and the British East Indies and the, the, you know, the East India Company and the, you know, and all of that and colonized everywhere, right? And then it became the US that maybe didn't colonized so directly and so vastly, but, but, but definitely they had the CIA things. to do that. Yeah. Culturally, them. intellectually. Yeah. yeah. Power, right. And for a long time, and now China represents probably the first non-Western realistic threat, right? Yeah. The first non-Western realistic Very threat realistic. to that, to that hegemonic uh, system that we have, right? Where are we moving toward like, Hey, maybe globally speaking, it's not just one power. It's this coexistence and tension. That's what Howie sees. Yeah, but but they, how obviously we know the hegemon in his household. He's just <laughs> he's just like I, I don't give a shit about if China or the US is the hegemon. I just want to have equal rights in my own house. <laughs> You're <laughs> fighting for the ERA in your household. <laughs> no, but I mean any country, like I said before, any country um in America's position would want to preserve their dominance and their power. Of course, that's understood. And I don't think anyone really has an issue with that because any country in that position would do the same. Mm. I think, and this really all ties into kind of a lot of the themes I think we've been talking about, about change, about resilience, about insecurities that we have and our identities, um, a product of being our environment. And to me, like, and again, I, I've, I've spoken so much about this, but it's it's not America preserving its power. It's the villainizing of the other side. It's yeah. the villainizing of China that I just find so silly at times. I find it frustrating at times. I find it sickening at times because... Well, it's profoundly offensive. It's profoundly offensive. And it really doesn't need to be that way. Like you said, there can be a coexistence. These are two great nations that are largely dependent on each other. Well, in the States, I mean, this, I mean, definitely largely dependent on each other. I mean, we're each other's, I think our biggest trading partners still to this day. But I think, you know, I mean, but the American system is so binary, right? And then we see this psychologically, we we see this in what we call group dynamics, Right when you insert one ex- one strong opinion into the group, it polarizes the entire group. It has that tendency, and so we see that ad nauseum in the American political system, where right where like the people that lose out are really the unfortunate middle, right? The moderates, the people who are not so right, because you kind of almost have to go to the polls in order to win elections, in order to raise money, in order to to get the political clout that you need to pass things. Like it's, 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 you know, I'm not saying that it's, it's a bad system. Like I understand why it was designed that way, but there are some, but there are some, you know, negative effects. And I think it plays off of this. And then, and, and during our last, you know, the last administration, when the, when the COVID came out and there was this whole like China flu and Kung flu and, you know, all of that, that it was, it was really, really, um, and, and, you know, the politicizing of health is what is, is so offensive to me (laughs) personally. Right. And, 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 and then that's obviously not is, you know, America does not have the monopoly on that. Right. Like we just went through a a lockdown here that I think was quite politicized, (laughs) you know, and, and it's one of the things is that, is that human fear, the fear that people 
have of losing position and power, right? The fear that men have of saying, I'm sorry, or, or the fear that a lot of men have of saying, no, I was wrong, or backtracking or walking back. Or the fear of change, like going back to fear of saying, change, fear of looking like the weak one, right? You don't want to look like the dog with its tail between its legs walking away, right? You never want. That's like how nobody wants to look, right? And and I think that plays into all of all of these. Well, yeah, fear、decisions. seems like to be a very powerful emotion that drives. And when you think about like loss aversion, when you think about when people think about like the. Trade-off or like the comparison between losing something versus gaining something, then I think we know that people are more afraid or disproportionately impacted by losing something than gaining something. So, based on that cognitive response,、um, we're we're very fearful creatures. Like it, it, you know. And so, I think like fear seems to be like one of the top emotions that's driving what's happening in the world. And I think what we've You know,、yeah. kind of like talked about today is that if we can not suppress, but if we can understand that initial response and have techniques for acknowledging it、if、and letting that feeling pass. Well, well, what I mean is, if we can view it differently, yeah, it's not the enemy. Yeah, fear is not the enemy. Fear is not the thing that you should cower away from and avoid at all costs. Fear is not the thing that's going to emasculate you, and Remove your power, and you know. And I use the word emasculate very intentionally, right? Because I think power is still centered around, you know.、Mm. You know, we are still very much a male-dominated world, particularly when we come when it comes to politics and decision making. You know, but but fear is not the thing that's going to cut off your penis, right? It's not what's going to emasculate you. It 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 is something that can be used, right? It's something that can be corralled. It's something that might be part of a system within you that is beneficial, right? That is motivating. That creates resilience, right? We have to look at it differently, right? And that's what I train my my my, my clients to do on a micro level, and th- and that's what I hope that、um, we can all come to on a macro level. Right, politically and geopolitically,、um, because I I do think that、um, I do think that that can make a profound、mm. difference in the way that we relate to each other as humans and as cultures. Well, I'm wondering, George. You know, I wonder if you feel like I do right now, and in the sense that I have never personally felt more isolated than I do today,、mm. for a number of reasons, and I think. The way I can describe everything from my personal perspective of what's happening, whether it's with COVID, whether it's with politics, I think it's just like there's accumulation of all these insecurities piling up on each other,、um, and I feel very isolated in in a way. And you know, we had a guest,、uh, Oscar Fuchs from the Mosaic of China, on the show. And he made a comment which I agreed with at the time, and he's like, he's like, no, you got your perspective is America and China, and I agreed with that at the time. But then the more I think about that comment, the more I disagree in the sense that, yeah, from his perspective, we're America and China, but I don't feel that way because I feel like there is this third culture space that you've mentioned before that. Some of us, especially us like ABC types, kind of fall into where we just don't feel like we're really fully accepted anywhere, whether it's America or China, and then so we're kind of in limbo in this third culture space. And things like the political climate, things like the lockdown, kind of really just reinforce that to me, and and make me just more and more insecure about the future. In many ways, and I'm wondering if if you feel that at all,、um, like what what your thought about that is. I do.、Um, I don't know that I feel. Well, I do. I, I think I, I do feel at times more isolated, and I think it's hard 
in this cultural space as ABC is living in China. I think it's hard enough as ABC is living in the States, right? Where you feel not as welcomed or you feel not as part of the actual conversation, right? You feel like um, the house guest a little bit. Right. I mean, it's fine. You're not, you know, you're the pleasant house guest, but you're like a guest and you're not necessarily, you're the pleasant one, right? Like you're not, you know, necessarily. You take your shoes off before you get it going yeah, into the house. Like you're you know? you're <laughs> nice enough. Like it's fine. Um, but, but you don't feel like you totally belong. And over here too, I think it's the same way um, where in a sense we do, you know, we're, we're, we're passing as they say in the sense that like, yeah, like we could, if we don't open our mouths and kind of keep our heads down, we look like a native, right? We look Chinese enough that we have the right color hair and the right color eyes and, 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 and stuff like that. And we can, we can pass and, and, but then, but then we also are not accepted, right? Our, uh, not accepted fully, right? We are also foreign, but over here, I think there's also that, you know, we're foreign, but then we're not like, sometimes we're not necessarily, viewed as foreign. Like a lot of foreigners are like, oh, you're not really foreign though. Like you're kind of, and the, you know, and it, and it creates this complicated response. Sometimes you're like, how comfortable do I feel about that? <laughs> like, well, you're foreign I, when it's convenient or not. Well, know? or it's, it's interesting. Like I, I, you know, um, someone I know, uh, you know, who is a Chinese American, you know, person, right. Went and interviewed for a job you know, at a company um, that was looking for a foreign hire. And, 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 and she went in and she, she, she interviewed and, 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 and it went really, really well. But when she was talking to the HR, the HR was like, we're really looking for a foreigner. And because when she was talking to the HR, she speaks Chinese, right? She's Chinese American. And so she was talking to the HR representative in Chinese because the HR representative is Chinese. And so, and she speaks Chinese very well because she was a good student and she learned. And I mean, you know, we're Asian Americans, right? So we got good grades and we, 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 we did, we did what we needed to do. And so, um, so she speaks Chinese well. And so the other person, I guess, didn't get that she was fully quote unquote foreign. Because didn't get the foreign vibe. Didn't get the foreign vibe as strongly because she's not like Ni Hao, yeah. right? She's more, you know, she's unaccented. So, um, you know, the foreigner was like, you know, we're really looking for her someone who speaks English and, you know, who, and she's like, Oh, you know, cause I'm actually American. Like English is my strongest language, right? Uh, I'm good with languages. And so I speak, you know, whatever, but you know, but I, I, I'm, you know, and the, and then the HR person was like, well, you know what I mean? Like we, um, you know, we're really looking for someone who looks foreign. Right. I think a lot of teachers get this. Like sometimes when like Chinese Americans are trying to be an English teacher and they're like, you know, we need someone that the market will understand as an English teacher, <laughs> right? But this wasn't that, right? And she was like, oh, you know, and it was, you know, and she was, she was telling me about this and I was, I, I, I just became, you know, so upset because I, I've encountered it too, right? Maybe not so blatantly, but it's kind of like where you are just never, I mean, I'll put it out there, when you're just never white enough wherever you go. You're just never white enough at home in the States, and you're never white enough even now in China, mm. apparently. And 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 it's like this um this interesting phenomenon that also plays into power and privilege, right? Because for so long the white ideal, you know, has been has been what was propagated globally. And so like, and so you needed to somehow show that you're white enough. Like when your white friends came over, you gotta make sure that, like, you know. Whitewashing, right? White, yeah. When you're embarrassed about, and you're embarrassed. You're embarrassed about like Chinese characteristics, right? So if you like brought a lunch to school that was like all that was Chinese like jealous. Dumplings. I still <laughs> remember my coworker, and I was a, I was a, an, a, I was an adult, like work in working, and I brought jelts, right? I brought dumplings, and this one coworker came by, a white coworker came by my cubicle, and was like, "What died?" You know, like she kind of like took a sniff, was like, "What died?" Mm -hmm. I was like. My older, I guess my lunch. My older sister, um, growing up, this is when we first immigrated to the states, right? And she's five years older than me, so she was. Uh, and we went to uh, initially we went to a public school, so she was uh, going into. She was in high school at the time, and she brought her own lunch, yeah, to school. And it was like her first day of school, um, and my mother had packed her this lunch 
and all the other students who were predominantly white yeah. um, just kept making fun of her because of the way it smelled, the way it looked. Sure. The, the fact that she was eating her lunch with chopsticks yeah. was, a, was a big thing. And, you know, kids, right? These are kids at the time. Yeah. So I'm not going to, like, you know, villainize them too harshly, but, yeah. like, but like you know, it, it's that they kind of experience the, that shapes you. They carry the ethos of the culture. Yeah. Right. And so we're not vilifying them, right? Because they're immature and they're they're young children. But but it it's the whole ethos that that it carries that there's this otherizing, right? And the otherizing is is bad, and we almost have to kind of make it bad in order to preserve our sense of cohesion or our sense of purity, right? If you take it to the to the extreme, and people have. And 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 we always, we saw this play out in the 20th yeah. century, like ad nauseum, and and to the yeah. to the detrimental effect of you know. You know, when history. I think about the pros and cons of this, and like throughout my life, like you know, there's been like lots of ups and downs in terms of how I think, and and you can get very emotional, right? And you can get really angry, like you can be scared for a while. Um, you can be really angry. And as time has passed and I kind of look back and I just ask myself, well, what are the pros and cons of being able to experience like what I've experienced? And like, I don't think you, if you ask most Asian Americans, like, okay, would you rather be white? I, I think if you really had a magic pill, I don't know if a lot of people would would take that on, you know? Yeah, like, I don't know. Quick, that, everybody answer. <laughs> well, I don't, I, I can answer. Like, I, I don't think I want to be white. I think it's that you wish that you had that station, Right, and but but if you're you the had... white person, you don't even look. Like, we've been talking about like the fact that it's hard to activate your gratitude because yeah. you're always normalized to your situation. So if you really are white, I have to think that you're thinking the same shit that we're thinking. You're like, fuck, I wish I was that other white guy. <laughs> Probably. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. like, like I said, there's power and privilege everywhere, right? Like, and I I enjoy, you know, I'm not white, but I enjoy a lot of privilege. Right, like I'm educated, and I, you know, I have a certain income, and I have, you know, whatever, and so, like, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of that, and I think we're talking about, like, again, we're sort of generalizing, I, and I feel bad about this, right? We're generalizing, sort of, like, white people, right? When there's like profound, profound differences, but what I mean is, like, the, the symbol of, of cultural hegemony that is symbolized in. You know the way that we glorify whiteness, I think, around the world, right? I, and then I do, and I do think, literally around the world, we glorify this, yeah. you know, power in 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 a story about this, like white and guy. It's, but it's only for the last few hundred years, of course, right? Like because before that, I think it wasn't like that. I think it's only, I mean, Europe was a shithole for most of its existence until the you know, the combination of science and like all that stuff. I don't True. know. I don't know what it was like. I honestly don't know what it was like before. Cause like, if you were to go back pre 1500s in China, sure, sure. was there that mindset? Like then, then it's, it's like no, actually no, debatable, of right? Yeah. Yeah. So of th course. That's also very interesting. Yeah. That, that is also right? very if interesting. If you were in like 500 AD, but maybe was it was less... like, maybe it was you're like, if you were Asian, you're like, you were the bomb. But that was a less globalized world though. For sure. Yeah. Right. That was a less globalized world where I, I think that there were less, there was less communication. Right. And now that, now that the world is like this more globalized place. And, and I, I mean, I hope, I, I hope that we're moving away from the concept of like one hegemon or one sort of like power concentrated in one culture or one symbol or one country where we are becoming more comfortable in the pluralistic world that we live in right now, right? Because that's not, I don't think at least is going anywhere. And so we have to become much better adjusted you know, but 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 I understand that you know geopolitically speaking, you know th there's always a threat, right? There's a, again it comes back to the controlling power of fear. Well, even that fear though, that fear is a story that's fed to us because if there wasn't the headlines, if there wasn't the press conferences, all these things, and we were just living our normal lives, would we feel this? Would we any of us feel this fear of this country versus that country taking over? I don't think we would. Hmm. I think we would just see people for people, and that would be it. I just, I just feel like we get the reason why individuals can get so politicized is because of the media and and 
all the information that we're fed, and mm-hmm. then it changes us, it politicizes us, it introduces new fears that we've never had before, mm. and they latch on. It's like Inception, right? And they plant that seed, and all of a sudden, you can't get rid of it, and I it's just in there. That. Yeah, yeah and, I agree with that. And it does, yeah. like if you think about it, right? Like all this, all these narratives, it doesn't affect your day to day. It really doesn't, no, right? No. But what the media feed, feeding you this information does is it connects that stuff. And creates the perception that those are the root causes of the problems of your life. So, like, so like each see, person yeah. has problems yeah. in their life, right? Like, we all got fucking problems. Okay, those problems are due to a number of factors, but they have probably very little to do with Russia or China or whatever it is. Sure. And so, what this stuff is trying to do, right? People that have a motive in this is taking all of that, whatever they want to vilify, and then connecting it to the problems in your life. And it's actually not, they're not correlated or connected. And by tying them together, then it activates you to be against that particular thing. That's really what it is. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. And that's why for taking it back to the mental health, you know, you know, area for a moment, like I, I, the concept of boundaries is something that I push a lot, right? The boundaries is something that we all have to, we have to decide for ourselves and, and really be good at enacting. We have to have mm. boundaries in order to maintain our own sense of cohesion and our own ability to navigate our own life and and world. And and especially during the lockdown, I think we had this love hate relationship with social media, right? We needed it for group buys and stuff, but did we need it for the constant like? When is the lockdown going to end? I heard this and I heard that and I heard that this was going to happen. And, you know, watch out because for the next two days, like something's going to happen, right? All of the rumors and all of the, 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 and, and I'm not saying that, you know, the videos that I, I saw too, and I think were important, right? Like really important to, to sort of help validate people's experiences because they were profound but I think that on the individual level, we need to draw boundaries about what we do, what we see, right? In order to preserve our ability to move forward with what what, what we need to do. Like Lem Moy, another guest, he's like, you can't learn about people through media. Mm. He was like, there's no way you can learn about people from media because media is just going to tell a story that's going to be biased. The only way that you can understand people is just by spending yeah. time with them. And like at that point, it's harder to fight people when you get to know them. You know, when you know their children and you know them, their what food they eat, it probably in general becomes harder to fight them. It's and harder I think to vilify them. Yeah, and it's a better yeah. world. I think there's like less wars and conflicts. It's harder to otherize them because otherize. you feel connected. You feel... Like, I understand that person, right? And so the vilification, the otherizing, and, and I can understand why that person has a profoundly different understanding and view of the world than I do. Well, that's the power of humanizing, right? Like when you can humanize another person, even if they're your mortal enemy, and you humanize them, you start relating to them. And then it's much harder to view them as a full-on enemy that you hate, hate. Yes. And and that's, and going just, just to tie it up, like, going back to the whole media thing like that's another thing i've noticed and this is i think a tool you can use to kind of spot where how these uh, narratives are being driven is are they humanizing what they're talking about Mm. because if you look at a lot of the western media um and just for the purposes of this conversation if they're talking about china right you'll you will hardly ever see a piece about China where they actually humanize the people of China. Mm-hmm. It's almost a mass of mm-hmm. people. Yeah. The government and the masses of people, faceless mm-hmm. people. It's, it's, a, it's actually a tool of storytelling when you can d- use humanization like kind of details to describe someone. That means you're trying to empathize with them. You're trying to paint them to be a figure where you can relate to. Whereas when they keep something as like a vague whole kind of just entity, yeah. right? And not an individual person. That's when you know there's kind of something, there, there's kind of a little something sketchy in, in terms of the narrative being put there. Agreed. Agreed. Or laziness. Or laziness. Hmm. But anyway, George, um, I think we've taken up 
too much of your time already. No, um, it was a great, great conversation and great whiskey. So <laughs> honestly, um, I know I've said this to you in private before, but um, I really just enjoy talking to you. Thank you. I am always honored when you can make the time to come on the show. I think you present things in a really relatable and human way. Um, even though you have a big picture view of things, you present things where I feel like I can just relate to you as a human being. Yeah. And I think obviously that probably goes a long way for you in, in your profession. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I don't know, I guess because maybe because I started this profession, like I said, on the other end of the couch, right? I started as a, as a patient first and then and as a provider second. So I, I, you know, I, I always try to share what I learn, not just from the professional or from the research or from the sort of ivory tower perspective, but mm -hmm. from a human perspective. And we're all learning from each other and we're all um, trying to understand each other. And I love coming onto this podcast, not only for the great whiskey, but... <laughs> but Only for the great whiskey. No, right? no, no. I mean, I think <laughs> our, our conversations are... You know, they're longer and they're more in depth and they're wide ranging and they're natural and they flow. And it's like as if we were sitting in a restaurant or something with a with a tape recorder, you know. Um, sorry, I'm dating myself. <laughs> For people there used with to be vinyl. this thing <laughs> with vinyl. there used to be, with a be this thing called a tape, right? And people are <laughs> like, What's a tape recorder? But anyway, like recording our our, our conversations. So I, I I really like it. I think it's a great um it's it's really informative and, and it's great fun for me. So thank you for, for having me. I look forward to our next time around yes. when we do this again. But for now, cheers, cheers and thank cheers, you so cheers. much for coming on. Thank cheers. you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That was Dr. Oh. George Who. I'm Justin. I'm human. I'm a dancer. <laughs> oh, that is so stupid. That was really bad. That is so stupid. <laughs> you um, got that? <laughs> that was so stupid. You can tell. <laughs> you can tell we're back. The Honest Drink. This is uh, our first episode back in studio. And uh, we'll keep you guys updated. But for now, be good. Be well. Peace. Peace.